Many claimed that had Italy remained in the central powers, the faction could have been victorious over the Entente. This statement has some validity to it, as it would most likely result in a quick victory, so Russia would still capitulate and the United States wouldn't join the war. This is not to say that Italy is somehow going to do too much, I expect them to sit on the mountainous front line with France. Even this is a nice distraction, Italy has colonies, so the Entente would need to commit more resources elsewhere. Also, if Italy joins at the beginning of the war, the Germans can have a chance to capture Paris, as the Schlieffen plan surprised the French, resulting in a lot of quick German gains. By quick, I mean a relative for the war. Belgium was never capitulated, but the war didn't see a lot of frontline movement in the Western Front, except for the initial German advance. How could Italy even join the Central Powers, and when would they join? Does this move allow for the Central Powers to be victorious? Let me show you what I came up with. I want to go back to the 19th century, where two major events occurred that affected both the immediate and distant future of Europe. These events are the unification of Germans and Italians into one single state, to form the German Empire and the Kingdom of Italy. Over the two decades, both countries struggled with a common enemy, which is the Austrian Empire. The Austrians were a rival of the then Kingdom of Prussia and long-term oppressor of the Italians living in the northern part of the Apennine Peninsula. For the Italian nation, the biggest milestone was their victory in the Prussian-Austrian War, thanks to which Venice was joined to the Italian Kingdom. Historically, Italy promised to join a possible invasion if it happened in the next three months of their representatives meeting, which it did, so relations between Prussia and Italy were quite good. After the subsequent defeat of France in the Franco-Prussian War, the German Empire arose in the north which still intended to continue the traditional alliance with the Kingdom of Italy, but at the same time sought reconciliation with Austria, which the Italians didn't like very much. Austria reformed and became known as Austria-Hungary, as the Hungarian portion had rebelled in 1848, resulting in Hungary to be under martial law up until 1867, so whole 19 years. The aforementioned Austria-Hungary then controlled the Italian populated Trentino, the western coast of Carniola and the eastern peninsula. All these territories were officially claimed by the Kingdom of Italy. In 1902 there was a crisis in Trentino, when the Austrian Emperor, Francis Joseph I, refused to hand over this Italian inhabited part of Saitoro to its other neighbor. This resulted in Italy to sign a secret non-aggression pact with France. In the subsequent Great War, the Italians thus decided to join the Entente, with the aim of acquiring these claimed territories by force. But what would it look like if in 1902, under pressure from the German Empire, the stubborn Francis Joseph I decides to give these disputed territories in favor of a stable alliance within the Triple Alliance. Let us not forget that Italy, Germany and Austria-Hungary were in a defensive alliance that was renewed every couple of years. Relations were good, but Italy continued to claim the Austrian territories. In this alternate history, Austria-Hungary, under pressure from the German Empire, eventually decides to hand over Trentino, the western coast of Carniola, and the Eastern Peninsula to the Kingdom of Italy, in exchange for the previously mentioned Stronger Alliance. At the same time, the Italians are recognized as claiming the French southeastern territories, east of the Rhone River, including the important cities of Lyon, Avignon, Grenoble, and Marseille, as well as the Mediterranean island of Corsica and French controlled Tunisia. While Lyon can be a stretch, Italy can at least try to regain Nice and Savoy provinces, which Sardinia Piedmont gave to France during the Second Wars of Italian Unification, in exchange for them joining against Austria. Thanks to all of these assumptions, there will be no reason for Italy to go over the site of the Entente. The Triple Alliance is still thereby secured. On the 28th of June 1914, Franz Ferdinand Diest, heir to the Austrian throne, would be shot in Sarajevo. A month later, Franz Joseph I declares war on the Kingdom of Serbia, while Germany declares war on Russia and subsequently on France, which finds itself at war on two fronts, as Italy also declares war at the same time. In response to Italy's involvement in the conflict, the United Kingdom decides to declare war on the Central Powers before the German army enters the neutral Belgium and Luxembourg territories. However, both countries are conquered during the autumn, and the German army is located 20 miles or 30 kilometers from the French capital city of Paris. Due to France stationing some troops on the Italian border, also in Tunisia, I would assume that Belgium would fall, and Germany would advance a bit more than they did historically. As the German army would be located so close to Paris, artillery shots can be heard in the French capital. The war is on their doorstep. All of this would happen in a couple of weeks, so the people would think that it's a repeat of 1871. 
where the Germans occupied Paris. The desperate French, with support of the British, would try to hold their ground, but the battle on multiple front lines began to quickly weaken the morale of both armies. After breaking the French lines, the Italian army entered the southeastern corner of France, with the aim of occupying Marseille, which they finally succeeded in October. Speaking of the successes of the Central Powers, I have some coins from all of these countries. This is a German silver half mark. Then we have the Italian centimes. This is 10 Hilera from Austria. And this is 20 Hilera from Hungary. If you did not know, Austria-Hungary used to have two currencies. I hope you learned something new today. I also wrote a book, it's about Germany losing so bad that the Kaiser flees to Tanganyika, where he establishes a government in exile. If you are interested in purchasing this book, check the pinned comment or in the video description. There is an ebook and physical copy available worldwide. Now, back to the video. The Russians managed to conquer most of Galicia in the meantime, as the Central Powers resources would be used elsewhere. But now that France is on the verge of capitulation, the Germans decide to send part of their divisions to the east. This is so they can prevent a possible Russian invasion of Slovakia and Carpathian Rutinia. Meanwhile, the Serbs are successfully defending themselves, but that would soon change. At the beginning of 1915, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire would join the Central Powers. As a result, the Eastern Front is more stabilized and the Italian fleet, supported by the Ottoman one, prepares to land in Malta and Cyprus, which will happen in the spring of the same year. Meanwhile, the Italian army succeeds in conquering Tunisia, while the Ottoman begins to approach the Suez Canal. For simplicity's sake, Serbia would capitulate soon after Bulgaria has joined, and they assumed that Albania would get invaded, as the Central Powers wanted to chase the Serbian army. The Italians can be very useful in locating the Adriatic Sea and to help combat in Albania. The Central Powers has the initiative, instead of the Entente. France has never taken any initiative and they are simply responding to the offenses of the Central Powers. This is why France would perform so poorly. If you think that's unrealistic, let me remind you that the French military uniforms look like this. The problem is that they are too bright, so the Germans would easily locate them and bomb them with artillery. The French would need a lot of time to take all the uniforms out and replace them with something else urgently. France is not as strong as they were historically, so they would be very vulnerable at the beginning of the conflict. In the summer, the Germans, together with the Italians, start a campaign with the aim of forcing the French to sign an armistice. The Germans push the Entente armies as far as Normandy. Thus, massive strikes and desertions begin to occur throughout France. The French decide to abandon the southeastern territory east of the Rhone River and fall back to a more defensive position and focusing on defending themselves against the Germans. The Italians occupy all of these territories, which would greatly boost the Italian morale. Let me remind you that the Italians are mostly occupying empty lands, such as Tunisia, and doing naval invasions on some islands. They are still very incompetent as ever, but it just so happens that the French are more incompetent this time. As for the fighting in North Africa and the Middle East, the Italians have already managed to conquer all of Tunisia, while the Ottoman Empire already controls both Kuwait and the entire Sinai Peninsula. The only territorial dispute is the Armenian inhabited northeastern territory of Turkey. I hope that some things don't happen to the Armenian people as a result of the Russian advances. Thanks to the success of the Central Powers on the Western Front, Spain also begins to reconsider joining the conflict which would help it acquire British control Gibraltar and some French colonies in Africa, including Morocco. I would predict that the Spanish would choose to join the conflict, which would result in the British troops in Egypt to start running out of ammunition and material. This is because the Gibraltar Strait would be blocked. While this is not a hard fire on 4 game and controlling Gibraltar doesn't mean that any ships cannot pass, you can assume that many would be sunk in that choke point. France would be cornered and I would say that there would be a coup d'etat in the rest of France. Representatives from the Central Powers and the revolutionaries in France would meet in usual location, perhaps Geneva in Switzerland, and discuss the possibility of ending the war for France. In the peace treaty, France officially surrenders all of Morocco to Spain, Tunisia, Corsica and the southeastern regions east of the Rhone River would be recognized as part of the Kingdom of Italy. While the entire lowland north of France would be temporarily controlled by the German garrisons until an armistice is signed by the British as well. French Congo and Gabon are also lost to the Germans. The new French government, led by the demoralized army and workers militias, begin to force the British troops to leave the European continent. This results in strikes and demonstrations even in the heart of the British Empire. This alternate French surrender is inspired by the historical one in Bulgaria, where the Bulgarians were ordered an offensive, but instead the army marched to the capital of Sofia, demanding an end of the war. 
Russia in the meantime has lost recently conquered Galicia and still controls the Ottoman Armenia. Even so, the first demonstrations also begin to break out in Petrograd and Moscow, with the aim of ending this bloody, senseless war. However, this war continues until the summer of 1916, when the German army successfully occupies the region of the former Congress of Poland, and the Kingdom of Poland is subsequently established on these conquered territories as a protectorate of the German Empire. During that time, as a result of Italian divisions attacking from Libya and the Ottoman units attacking from the Sinai Peninsula, the British were gradually forced out of Egypt. After two years of bloodshed, both the British and the Russians subsequently sign an armistice as well. In the peace treaty, the United Kingdom gives up Gibraltar to Spain, Malta and Egypt to Italy, and Cyprus, the Sinai Peninsula and Kuwait to the Ottoman Empire. Russia is forced to cede Poland to Germany as a protectorate, while Turkish Armenia is gradually returned to the Ottoman Empire. Belgian Congo becomes part of German Middle Africa. Montenegro and Serbia become vassal states of Austria-Hungary, while all of Macedonia becomes part of Bulgaria. This ends the Great War, which lasted only two years. It is not certain which way Europe would go. Humiliated France is likely to become a far-left Marxist country like the Second Spanish Republic of 1931-1936. The United Kingdom is likely to follow in the path of ultra-nationalism, and Russia, well Russia is threatened by both scenarios. In Austria-Hungary, in which Emperor Francis Joseph I dies in 1916, his democratically oriented great-nephew Charles I becomes the new monarch, who since the beginning starts to strive for a reformation and federalization of the empire. Galicia and Bukovina are handed over to the newly created Kingdom of Poland, in order to get rid of Polish nationalists. At the same time, it is supposed to guarantee a strong ally in the events of future Russian aggression. This is possible as Poland is German client state, most likely ruled by the relative of the Kaiser, and Austria-Hungary is a German ally, so it's not a big loss. Thanks to the then publicly known Charles the First Wolf and admiration for the Czech people, the Czechs gain autonomy just like the Hungarians did in 1867. At the same time, this is a step that would prevent further assassinations of future heirs to the Austrian throne. During the 1920s, the new federal monarchy became a constitutional democratic one, similar to that of Britain at the same time. Neighboring Germany on the other hand is becoming more authoritarian power, strengthening its hegemony over in Africa. Meanwhile, Italy also becomes one of the greatest colonial powers in the world. Unlike Germany, however, it retains constitutional form. Egyptians, Tunisians and French are given local autonomy in order to gain the favor of the local people. Unfortunately, neighboring France is gradually becoming an increasingly radical leftist republic suppressing human rights. As for Britain, with the help of the Labour government, it is trying to stabilize the country economically, but its anti-war and anti-military policy is caused by the dissatisfaction and above all the unemployment of the British soldiers and officers. This will result in a gradual return of the days of the absolute monarchy after the death of King George V in 1936 as his son, Edward VIII, is this time far more popular than his brother, George VI. Thus, since the second half of the 1930s, the United Kingdom is beginning to become an ultra-nationalist absolute monarchy, which will certainly cause a wave of trade union strikes, but the gradual decay of democracy will not be ultimately prevented. You can think of this like the Kingdom of Italy, where King Victor Emmanuel III appointed Benito Mussolini as Prime Minister. At the same time, France would most likely find itself in a civil war between the royalists and Catholics, seeking to end the anti-clerical terrors of the French communists and socialists, trying to stay in power. With the support of Britain and apparently neighboring Spain, the French royalists eventually win, and France becomes once again a monarchy, albeit partially administered by the United Kingdom. Now, if you watch this and think, wait, this isn't Kaiserreich war, well, it would be very boring for me to copy somebody else's work. So I came up with something a bit more original. While France is a monarchy, there is going to be ultra-nationalist prime minister. The central powers do not mind this move at all. Thanks to the ongoing alliance with Spain, the Germans and the Italians can attack France from three sides in the event of another European-wide conflict. Anyway, we haven't talked about Russia yet. Since the Great War was an even greater humiliation for the Russian people, even more than the Russo-Japanese War, it is likely that sooner or later Tsar Nikola II will be overthrown. This time, however, Germany will not invest in the Bolshevik Revolution, but the nationalist-oriented national minorities of the Russian Empire, such as Finns, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians and Ukrainians. This makes fundamentally more sense, as they can secure independent states and install German Nobelmen as rulers, effectively taking control over these countries. 
Not to mention that splitting up the countries from the Russian Empire would only make them weaker. However, if in the 1920s all of these minorities revolted at once, probably as a result of the Tsar's attempt to suppress these revolutions in blood, a communist uprising would arise in Petrograd and Moscow. Since in this alternate history the Bolsheviks were not subsidized by the German Empire, they will not have enough power and ammunition to conquer all of Tsarist Russia. This is even if they arise in Russia, which is not guaranteed to happen. Finland, the Baltic countries and Ukraine will become independent countries with the support of the Central Powers, while Russia will become a Soviet Republic. From now on however, it will not be easy to guess which direction the world will develop. The Imperial Age will certainly not end soon and the United States will remain an isolated paradise. With America's isolation, it's fair to say that the Great Depression caused by irresponsible American borrowing will never take place. I don't throw out the possibility of a similar economic crisis to be caused, but this time by the Germans. If there were to be another conflict between the European powers, Africa itself would become the new battleground this time. The only thing that I haven't mentioned yet is the Ottoman Empire, which despite the territorial gains would sooner or later disintegrate due to debt, corruption and political disunity. After the Bolsheviks would take power in Russia, they would most likely try to trigger a Kemalist revolution in Turkey, which would probably succeed this time, as well as if the central powers do not intervene. This I would admit is too optimistic, so I will rule it out. The Second World War can be started by France, with their ambitions to recapture most of their lost territories. Germany is truly in trouble, so naturally you need to let me know if you want to see part 2. I suggest you take a look at this video where Greece joined the central powers. Check it out if you are interested and if that would result in a German victory. I hope to see you there.